John Locke, the son of an attorney, he was a Greek lecturer, another one of these smart guys, taught moral philosophy at Oxford, and had a great distaste for perplexed scholasticism. What is scholasticism? That's that philosophical system, the theological system of St. Thomas of Aquinas, 13th century. St. Thomas came up with all these ideas at the end of his life, said, everything that I've written is like straw. Locke would have agreed. A perplexed philosophy, a perplexed theology in scholasticism. Let's throw that out and start over. Could we? John Locke later became interested in chemistry and physics. He earned his medical degree, was a doctor, and then he got into public affairs, sort of like in, 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 in the role of an ambassador sort, you know, helping as secretary to various public persons. His essay concerning human understanding explores the mind's capacity and understanding, and it's important because he was the first philosopher to devote his main work to human understanding. Why we as human beings understand the world the way that we do. He wrote two treatises on civil government, which, was atta which attacked the divine right of monarchs. How interesting, remember, this is the time of the revolution. A revolutionary, William of Orange, is coming in and unseating the king. Does the king have a right to be king? He's saying, no. There is no divine right. God did not choose you to be our king. There is no divine right to any, for any monarch. We're talking about empiricists. We said that there are going to be three principal empiricists in Great Britain. Who are the three of them? Locke is the first, the father of British empiricism. Hobbes was just setting the stage. Now it's getting good. Hobbes set the stage. The three principal empiricists are Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. We're going to talk about all three this evening. Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. So Locke then is going to be the father of British empiricism. Empiricism again, meaning all of uh, everything that we know comes through our senses. Through taste, touch, sight, hearing, smell. All knowledge comes to us from our from our senses. So Locke is going to argue against innate ideas. Does he believe in the tabula rasa? He believes we're a tabula rasa. Everything when you came into this world, you were a blank slate. God news for you. There was nothing in your in your head except for a gray mass when you came into this world. There was, there, was just, there was a brain in your head that was waiting to be filled. It was a blank page. So Locke argued against innate ideas. He said all our ideas can be explained without this theory of innate ideas coming from God. You don't need to believe that God like, implanted these innate ideas in your brain before you were born. Everything you know came to you through your senses. So the theory of innate ideas is unnecessary. He said, look at your kids. Have you ever looked at your kids or your grandkids? He said, if you look at your kids, you will see how it is that everything they learned on this earth, they took in from the outside. Right? First, they learned to distinguish their different, you know, they learned to distinguish what belonged to them, their hands, their toes. They started to distinguish other people. Everything they, they learned came to them from the outside. There was, they were a blank slate when they came into this world. And you started programming them. So he said, look at children. See how it is that their ideas are formed? How it is that they develop? They increase in number with experience. Sensation is the chief source of our, our ideas. Our ideas come from the senses. Because we're directed outward. And re our reflection, our introspection on the ideas only come later. The rationalists, when they close their eyes and their ears, got news for you. What are the ideas that they have when they close their eyes and their ears? They all came to them through their senses. Locke's general principle that all our ideas are grounded in experience and depend on it formed the foundation of classical British empiricism, which is why he's known as the father of British empiricism. Essentially, his, his main principle, everything that you know came through your senses. That's empiricism. Did Locke create that idea? Actually, he didn't. We talked about scholasticism, St. Thomas of Aquinas. He really was an empiricist. He didn't believe in innate ideas. He said, everything that we have comes from our experience. What did Locke believe about ideas? We said that Locke was important because 
He was the one who told us how it is that we understand the world. Okay? So how do we understand the world according to Locke? What does Locke say about how we understand the world? He says that there are simple ideas and complex ideas. Let's try, to, let's try to figure out what is a simple idea. A simple idea is something that comes from, through our senses. So that, for instance, I touched something, ouch, and that was hot. Okay? I just, I just had an experience of heat. That's a, that's a simple idea. Heat is a simple idea. Collar. I just saw something, and it's brown. My parents are telling me that this is brown. And I'm not colorblind, but I see what they see. Oh. So I'm seeing... I'm having an experience of color. The experience of scent. That's smoke. Oh, someone tells me that that, that thing that I smell is smoke. Okay? So I, I'm taking in all of this data through my senses. Those are simple ideas. So far so good? So babies, take in these simple ideas and we, we eventually teach these babies, we tell them what these things are. That's heat. Ouch! That's smoke. Oh, that's color. Brown. And then what are <coughs> complex ideas? Complex ideas then, when we take those simple ideas and form other ideas off of them, those become the complex <coughs> ideas. So that, for instance, the idea of a table, that comes from my experience of all of these things coming together. Hard. Okay. I can feel it, and it's hard. Tables are hard. Have you ever noticed that? Tables are hard. You know, there, there's just something about tables, the way that they look, the way that they feel. There's just something about tables. When we take it into the sentences, we, we create these complex ideas of things like tables based on our sensory experience of them. So we combine simple ideas into complex ideas and we form new ideas. Think about it, like the word beauty. Have you ever seen beauty? No, beauty is a complex idea where you've seen things, people have told you, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. And this thing is beautiful. And that thing's beautiful. Okay, let's take a look at what all of these things have in common. Oh, I see. That's what beautiful means. That's ugly. That's ugly. That's ugly. And that's ugly. Okay, we take all those ugly things, we lump them together, and suddenly, oh, that's ugly. And we have these ideas of what ugly and beautiful are based on things that are described to us as those things, based on our sensory perception of things. That So we take those simple ideas, and we, in our mind, put creates these more complex ideas. Things like beauty or gratitude or the human person, an army, the universe, right? The universe, where did we come up with that idea? Okay, we took simple ideas and put them together. So for instance, John Locke said, a lump of sugar. How did you get to know what a lump of sugar was? It came to you through your senses. A lump of sugar is always white, okay? You can see it, and it's white. It may be a lump of sugar. Put it together with other things. A lump of sugar is always hard. Okay? A lump of sugar is always sweet. Taste it. Okay? So if it's white and hard and sweet, got news for you, could be a lump of sugar. Lumps of sugar are always white, hard, and sweet. So that's the complex idea of a, of a sugar cube. Where did it come to you? From your experience of the senses. Complex ideas, he says, are archetypes of the mind's own making. So I got news for you. Sugar cube doesn't exist. A sugar cube is an idea that you have of that hard, white, sweet thing. That hard, white, sweet thing that exists, you call it a sugar cube. The idea of a sugar cube is only in your head. You call it a sugar cube. I'm glad you call it a sugar cube. It's your way of understanding it. But that, that idea is in your head. Some things exist only in our minds as ideas. Some of those complex ideas that we're talking about, like murder or hypocrisy, or later Hume would say God, those things are simply ideas that exist in your head. They don't really exist outside of your head. What is murder? Murder, oh, I understand. That's when one person kills another, okay? That really doesn't exist. That's your, it's an idea. It's how I understand. But they don't exist. They're just ideas. Hume would later say, that idea that you have of God, I'm glad that you have that idea of God in your head, but it doesn't exist. God doesn't exist like you imagine God. You just have this idea of God. He said, each of our ideas receives a name so that that white, hard, sweet thing, you gave it a name. What name did you give it? Sugar cube. And you told your child, sugar cube. 
your child understood, oh, that must be a sugar cube. White, hard, sweet, sugar cube, okay? So now I understand what the sugar cube is, my child understands what the sugar cube is because we gave it a name. So with love, he said, <clears throat> with our five senses, how do you teach faith? Excellent question. So what's happening is, is faith a simple idea or a complex idea? That is a complex idea. Follow me? Faith is a very complex idea. Let's try the example of God. You're not born with it. You're not born with it. Not for a lot. There, you are a tabula rasa. You're a blank slate when you come to this world. Which means that your parents have programmed, your parents or others have programmed you to think a certain way and giving you certain ideas. And that's what you likely believe. Because our ideas about God and the spiritual world, things of the faith, how fascinating. But those are complex ideas that come to us the same way through our senses and through our reflection of simple ideas. Through someone telling us, this table is limited. It's only eight feet long. God is not limited. Ooh. Someone just planted an idea in your head of what God is. Do you follow me? There are some things in this world that are limited. Human beings are limited. God is not limited. God is all-powerful. Wait a minute. This is an idea that someone just planted in your head. They just planted the seed in your head of how God is. Right? We as human beings are sometimes powerless. Got news for you. God is powerful. God is all-powerful. It's an idea that someone put into your mind about God. A complex idea. Does that mean that God is all-powerful? It doesn't mean that God is all-powerful. It means that someone told you that God is all-powerful. And you believe it. Let's keep going. The complex idea of God and of the spiritual would come to us in the same way from simple ideas and reflection. When we frame the idea of God, we enlarge to infinity the ideas of those qualities which it is better to have than to be without. Ooh, think about this for a moment. Is it better to be good or is it better to be bad? Is it better to be good or bad? Better to be good. So then God is the biggest good that you can imagine. Is it better to love or to hate? Better to love. Okay? So imagine God to be the biggest possible love in this world. Is it better to be powerful or weak? Powerful. Okay? God is the most powerful thing in the universe. Better to know or not know? Better to know. God is that thing in the universe that knows everything. You follow me? God is that idea where we take what is good. It's better to be something than not to be something. We take those things that it's better to be, and we, we amplify them to infinity, and that is God, according to Locke. Now, let's go back to scholasticism. Remember that man, St. Thomas Aquinas, and all of his friends, they had this concept that they referred to as transubstantiation. Hobbes hated words like that because they didn't have any meaning. right? Transubstantiation was that belief that when Father Jamie takes a, a, a piece of bread, says certain words, suddenly it tastes like bread, smells like bread, looks like bread, but it's not bread. It changed. What was their way of explaining that? That the accidents stayed the same. The things that come in through our senses are the accidents. How it looks stayed the same. How it tastes stayed the same. How it smells stayed the same. How it felt stayed the same. The accidents stayed the same, but our friends, the scholastics, said, what changed? The substance. Looks like a dog, smells like a dog, barks like a dog, but it's no longer a dog. It's a cat. What changed? The substance of it. Ooh, wait a minute. Locke, then, is going to say that this whole distinction of accidents and substance, you know what? I believe the accidents, the things that I can see and touch and taste and smell, I can see the breath. I can see the dog, but all this, the underlying substance, got news for you, never seen it. I have this complex idea that comes into my mind of bread, that bread tastes a certain way, looks a certain way, feels a certain way, and so we call that bread, like sugar cube, right? We all agree on what that is. We have an idea of it. So for Locke, then, we can only know the accidents, we can never know the substance. The substance 
lies beyond our sense experience. You say that it's the body of Christ, that's an act of faith. Because I still see bread, and I still taste bread. The substance is beyond the sense experience. We still see it, the accidents. We taste the accidents. So the ideas of substances then, we think, correspond to extra... We have these ideas of substances, and we believe that they, that they correspond to some external reality. For instance, God. I have the idea of God. I believe it refers to some external reality. True, I have, the, I, I have the idea of a unicorn too, but for some reason I don't believe in unicorns. I don't believe there's a unicorn out there in the same way I believe that there's a God out there. Lot was a good Christian, though. He did have a place for divine revelation in his system. For instance, he believed in the immortality of the soul on the resurrection of the body, which is fascinating, being an empiricist. But he believed that these things don't come to us through our senses, that these things come to us through revelation, and that there's a place for revelation, for God's Word, for the Scriptures. But he had a distaste for the enthusiasm of Mario and his friends, of people who believed that they had private divine revelations. God told me this. Or the Blessed Virgin Mary told me this, right? Wait a minute, that's not objective. That's, that's your experience? There's nothing objective about there. There's no way that we can verify that. He said that they were persuaded of their revelations by what, Mario? By their feelings. But I just have this feeling. He says that that's feeling, that's not reason. It didn't come to you by reason. That comes to you through your feelings. There is no objective grounds for belief in personal revelation. But I just feel that that was God talking to me last night. He also said, propositions that are contrary to reason, like transubstantiation, substance changes, the absence of reason, that doesn't make sense, he said. Things like transubstantiation that are contrary to reason are wrong and cannot have been revealed by God. Transubstantiation cannot come from God because it is obviously wrong. Our moral ideas, our ideas of what's good and bad, right or wrong, where do those come from? They come from experience too. It's not so much about getting from God, it's about coming from experience. What causes pleasure is good. What causes pain is bad. 